Coming up in the morning edition, look out for more possible lockdowns as emergency orders will be extended. Also, at Cabin and I, I agree that the prudent thing to do is to defer final deliberations and meet the FSR in December. The government explains why the fiscal report will be delayed. And we have a lot of people on the streets who are mentally challenged. Mentally challenged. And they walk the streets every single day. We see them. We need to get them off the street. The impact of the pandemic on feeding the needy in our midst. Those stories coming up when the morning edition returns. First, it's more than just our name, more than just our achievements. It's our nature, and it's where we put our customers. At Bahamas First, we've refreshed our look, but our nature remains the same. We design insurance solutions that protect our customers from life's uncertainties, whatever they may be. We equip you for the future so that you can recover stronger. Bahamas First, what's first for you comes first for us. We're here to help you. We're here to hold your hand. We're here to support you. I think it's everyone who sacrifices their life to serve the needs of others are all heroes. So we all just kind of get together and do what's right for our patients. The human connection is what bonds all of us. I'm truly proud to be part of the Pineapple family. What matters most is your health. Be proactive about it. I'm Desmond Saunders. Cool and windy weather greeting you this Thursday morning. Also, a cold front near the southeast Bahamas expected to gradually stall and will generate strong to gale force winds across the Bahamas. In all areas, weather cloudy with passing showers likely. Well, we now head out to the streets on this cool Thursday for your traffic commute. Our Lloyd Allen and team in the Palmdale area. The traffic report is sponsored by Bahamas First. First in insurance, today, tomorrow. Well, it's a great start to your Thursday morning. Good morning, Desmond. Good morning, Bahamas. This is your first look at traffic. We're coming in from the area of Montrose Avenue and Madera Street. If you are familiar with this area, of course, you know that there are significant businesses here. And so if you need to approach this area at this time, traffic is flowing nice and smoothly so there are no obstructions. We also want to make motorists aware, particularly in the areas of Foxo Road South, um, Faith Avenue South, as well as Rosetta Street. Now, Rosetta Street, there's a continuation of a project to uh, introduce sidewalks there. Very important, those roads are narrow. That continues in Foxo Road South. We know that the road was being raised to assist with occasional flooding. And then finally, in the Faith Avenue South area, we know, of course, that road has been begging Ministry of Works for a repaving for some time. Good news, they're more than 50% complete, and so that road paving exercise should only be uh, ongoing for another few days. This morning, we're also joined by Sergeant Crestonia Johnson from the Royal Bahamas Police Force Traffic Division, who, of course, is giving us an initial look at overnight traffic. Hello, Plaza, good morning to you, and the Plaza, good morning, Bahamas. Overnight, we've had eight accidents, six involving damage and two involving injury. At this time, there are still 13 persons who remain hospitalized as a result of being involved in a traffic accident. And Officer Johnson, uh, we spoke earlier before we started this morning about the idea that as uh, restrictions are being lightened, there is more flow of traffic. But many motorists uh, have been out of the loop, so to speak, um, during those particular rush hour periods. What advice can you offer to motorists when, uh, you know, utilizing roads, there may not be a lot of traffic, but caution and care obviously is still very important. Yes, well, we're into a whole adjustment period and getting back to, to the new norm. It's going to, take, it's going to take, to, take some time. And as it relates to taking time, we're just uh, thinking about those accidents that occur during that low uh, traffic period. 
we find that those accidents are the more severe accidents that have more extensive damage. So um, as much as possible, we, we just want to uh, advise the general public. Everybody is in a transition period. If you're utilizing the street now, we're, we're going to see an, 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 an increased number of vehicles that are use, utilizing the road. And in, in that, you want to now adjust and lower your speed. If you're at the traffic control lights, again, adhere to the traffic control lights and the street signs. And as much as possible, another thing that I've seen uh, is persons not utilizing their seatbelt. Remember, a seatbelt is a safety mechanism inside your vehicle to protect you. And we find that a lot of people, if they're involved in traffic accidents, when they're not wearing their seatbelt, they tend to have more damage, sorry, more injury to the face, facial area and the upper body area. That area is a very sensitive area. And any any injury that you would receive, if you want to, as much as, much as possible, avoid getting those injuries. All right? So, as, so if you can, when you're traveling on the street, please, please, please. Be mindful that you need to stop to those traffic control lights. You need to pay attention to the street signs. You need to pay attention to the volume of traffic that's on the street as well as pedestrian traffic. And as we conclude this morning, uh, a special shout out goes to Constable Ken Ken Major. Ken Vard Major. Ken Vard Major. He's been on the force for 34 years. Today is actually his last day. He's here with us uh, on this location, a little camera shy, but of course uh, we want to celebrate him as he makes his transition into the era of retirement. Yes, he is my mentor. I met him when I joined the force um, 14 years ago, and I think he's, he counts to one of the reasons why I'm here now. All of the te- um, When it comes to knowledge about traffic, he's one of the most knowledgeable persons that I know. He's an excellent, understanding person, and he's someone to look up to. He's also a deacon in his church. Uh, he, keep, he took me to church. <laughs> so, yes, shout out, kudos to Officer 999 Major. All right. Uh, I was trying to get him to come on set, but he's very shy. Uh, but of course, uh, I'm hoping to do a follow up with him to talk about his amazing uh, career. And of course, uh, he said not to forget that he is being honorably discharged. That's a look at your morning traffic report again, coming in from the era of Palmdale for the morning edition. Lloyd Allen, ZNS Network News. Now to your morning top stories. Well, don't get out of the lockdown mood just yet. The emergency powers COVID-19 orders will be extended again. The orders are now in effect until November 30th. Prime Minister, the Most Honorable Dr. Yuvid Menes made the announcement in the House of Assembly last evening. He indicated that when House proceedings resume next week, Wednesday, November 25th, he plans to make to move a resolution to extend the emergency powers COVID-19 orders to the end of December. Well, the nation's leader also providing an update on the annual fiscal strategy report. It sets out the government's strategic priorities with respect to revenue collection, spending, and financing over the medium term. The government is required to present the report to the House of Assembly by the third Wednesday in November, but according to the Prime Minister, the current health climate has led to a delay. Given the fluid nature of the ongoing COVID-19 pandemic and its economic impact, my cabinet and I have agreed that the prudent thing to do is to defer final deliberations and release the FSR to December. The speaker, the duration and intensity of this health crisis remain uncertain. Although there have been recent positive developments on the medical medical front. The sharp and ongoing revisions to the macroeconomic forecast produced by various international agencies, including the International Monetary Fund, confirmed difficulties in developing firm macroeconomic forecasts. The Prime Minister also pointed out that despite the delay, the government has lost, not lost sight of its fiscal responsibility. The highest standards of fiscal transparency and accountability, and is taking extra diligence in crafting our strategies for revenue and expenditure. Even amid these unusually volatile times, we will seek to ensure that our forecasts are aligned as closely as possible to our overarching fiscal sustainability goals. 
Good economic news on the horizon for thousands of hotel workers who will soon be heading back to work. It's a positive move beyond measure for Hotel Union President Darren Woods as Atlantis and other properties prepare to bounce back. Atlantis has made the announcement that they are going to be opening on the 10th of December. And we're hoping and praying that that holds true. Um, because, you know, the first time they announced their opening would have been back in July. And the rising numbers of cases in the U.S. caused them to push it back. And if you've been following what's happening over there, they've been having record numbers of cases on a daily basis. So we're really hoping that um, the cases over there subside somewhat. And then, of course, they hold through, true to their, their promise to open in December. With some 8,000 employees, Atlantis is the largest private sector employer in the country, which is hoping this move will have a domino effect. We believe that if, if particularly Atlantis and Bahama, um, if they're able to open, that would send a, a good signal to the traveling public, the tour operators, that the Bahamas is again open for business. And then what it does, it may also send a signal to the smaller properties to begin the same thing, opening, whether it's um, a number of rooms at a time, so that persons can begin to, to go back to work. Because we recognize that the hospitality industry occupies thousands of persons. I mean, the, on the front line, you may have up to some 30,000. Those that are connected to it, meaning the straw vendors, the hair braiders, the taxi drivers. the So all of these persons will then begin to be able to go back to work. Bahamas High Commissioner to Canada, His Excellency Alvin Smith, has completed his tenure. A release from the Ministry of Foreign Affairs confirmed that he returned to the Bahamas on November 7th. High Commissioner Smith assumed office in December 2017, becoming the ninth High Commissioner to serve as a head of mission in the Bahamas High Commission in Canada and concurrently serving as a Bahamas' permanent representative to the International Civil Aviation Organization. Just before admitting office, High Commissioner Smith served as chair of the CARICOM Caucus in Canada. First Secretary at the Mission at Ottawa, Chanel Brown, will serve as Chargé d'Affaires until a new High Commissioner is appointed. While well, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs also announcing that Bahamas permanent representative to the United Nations, Her Excellency Sheila Curie, has also completed her tour of duty and returned home on November 6. During Ambassador Kerry's tenure at the UN, she was appointed by the UN President of the General Assembly in October 2018 as co-facilitator of the negotiations on the outcome document of the Summit on Sustainable Development Goals held in September 2019. She was instrumental in the country's re-election to the Committee on the Elimination of Discrimination Against Women for 2021-2024 and the historic election to the United Nations Human Rights Council for 2019-2024. 2021, a first for the Bahamas. Kerry has served as career ambassador overseas for many decades, working in the Bahamas missions in Canada, Washington, D.C., Miami, New York, and the People's Republic of China. First Secretary Charmaine Williams has been appointed Charge of Affairs until a new ambassador is appointed. Well, a number of awards to be presented to key individuals during ceremonies at Government House today. Due to the current pandemic and the protocols restrictions, there will be three ceremonies beginning at 9 a.m. at Government House. Well, still to come, reaching out and touching lives, a look at the challenges under the pandemic. Morning Edition returns. The Neighborhood Watch is the eyes and ears of our community. Who knows your community better than you? Who knows the problems that your community face better than you? So, who can find the solution to those problems better than you? We joined the National Neighborhood Watch Council and became more organized and fortified. We started to do our own patrols. We got to reduce our gas tank thefts. We got to reduce home breaking. And Minister Dames just donated a solarized camera that helps to monitor this park. We've also had a lot of break-ins by the same individuals. So we, as a community, decided on the recidivism prevention program. I came from that kind of background where I was a criminal. I abused drugs and I was in and out of prisons and institutions. 
And so when Mr. Nishka Johnson told me about this initiative, I jumped on board right away. Here in Stable and Gardens, we are one. Join the National Neighborhood Watch Council and help build a network of communities. Welcome back. A family is in mourning after their relative died in a structural fire early this morning. Preliminary reports indicate that shortly after midnight, the fire department was alerted to a structural blaze on Tyler Street. Upon arrival, the Delta unit met a single-story structure engulfed in flames. The fire was extinguished a short time later. A sweep of the dwelling place was conducted and resulted in the discovery of the body of an adult male in the northwestern portion of the building with no signs of life. Active investigations are underway. Old Member of Parliament for Southern Shores and Social Services and Urban Development Minister Frankie Campbell speaking to observances marking International Men's Day, which will be celebrated today under the theme Men's Health and Well-Being. It is imperative that all of us men and young boys position and keep ourselves healthy so that we would be able to protect our families. I'm grateful for the various partnerships with public and private agencies associated with health and well-being and the many programs organized to hold public discussions on issues such as maintaining good health, improving gender relations, promoting gender equality, highlighting positive role models, and discrimination against men and boys, as well as celebrating their achievements and contributions to family and the community as a whole. Minister Campbell also noted that Universal Children's Day will be celebrated one day later, this Friday, November 20th. That there has been a paradigm shift as a result of our ratifying the Rights of the Child Convention in 1991. I'm here to tell this house and the Bahamas that children have a right to be heard, and that we as parents must encourage that right and ensure that that right is coupled with the responsibility of telling the truth when they seek to be heard. A local charity is doing its part to help those residents hit hard by the current pandemic. President of Great Commission Ministries, Bishop Walter Henschel, says since the COVID-19 crisis, his ministry has been overwhelmed with persons seeking housing and food assistance. He's seen firsthand the effects inflicted by the current crisis. His Great Commission Ministries on Wolf Road dishes up to 4,400 meals per day or dishes over 400 meals per day with accumulated expenses of up to $50,000 per month. Meantime, the ministry is hoping to address the issue of homelessness in the country. His organization hoping to erect a facility for the destitute among us. We have a lot of people on the streets who are mentally challenged. Mentally challenged. Then they walk the streets every single day. We see them. We need to get them off the street. They've been neglected and rejected for the last 10, 15 years. Nobody's checking for them. It's time now to address this situation and help these people. They are precious and they need help. They need to have to eat just like everybody else. And then we have another group of homeless persons, those persons who um, just had hard times. Even before COVID, we had, homeless, we had a, a growing number of homeless persons. People who just hit hard times, lost their job. Some people got in trouble, some people got on drugs, whatever it is, but we have to help them. We need, people, we need persons who can help to help us. The more people help us, the more we can help those. Now the Rotary Club of Nassau recently donated $500 worth of food supplies to the commission. Bishop Hanschel hopes more corporate donors can step forward and answer the call to the less fortunate in the community.
Now to Centerville. The Over the Hill community of Centerville is comprised of a rich history and one deserving of protection. According to Member of Parliament for the area, this legacy is part of the reason for the campaign themed Centerville Christmas Cleanup Initiative. The Centerville Christmas Cleanup Initiative began in early October, where we actually, we were in Spence Street in the Mason's Edition area. We provided a dumpster for the community. And when we saw the efforts of the people themselves in terms of cleaning up their area and their environment, we thought it important to embrace the initiative constituency-wide. Well, Chipman says residents simply needed a hand with discarding of items from their yards and empty lots. He is committed to transporting that dumpster to other areas in Centerville, including the Valley, Windsor Lane, Fritz Lane, Farm Road, and the surrounding areas. The project receiving positive feedback from residents who remain thankful that hope remains in the over-the-hill communities like Centerville. Garbage. It cause plenty rats and stuff like that. So cleanliness is next to godliness, first of all. So this is a good opportunity. A lot of persons who don't live in the area normally come through here and they see this empty lot and just bring their trash. But we are glad to have this garbage bin here to put our trash in at this time. Well, for you ice cream lovers, we have a treat for you this morning. A business venture started by a very young entrepreneur. Charles Fisher tells us who she is and how she got started. These tasty, refreshing treats have become a must-have on Harbor Island. And the new business venture of 16-year-old Raven Cash. It's called Raven's Crave. First, let's just find out how she got started. I've always been drawn to the kitchen, cooking, baking, things like that was always my passion. So around my ninth or 10th birthday, my parents bought me a Hello Kitty ice cream machine and I started making ice cream. When I was around 12 years old, I started selling my ice cream in one of the major food stores on Harbor Island. But I moved to Nassau when I was 13, so I stopped making ice cream and no one here knew my recipe, so no one was able to make it and continue selling it. But I recently moved back for a while due to the recent pandemic and I didn't really have anything to do. So my mother was like, why don't you start making ice cream again? So we started, this time we got bigger, more efficient machines. We worked on marketing. We got new labels, new packaging. We started taking orders, delivering, you know, trying to get the business out there more. As for what's the ingredients to make everyone crave for this taste? It's a secret because only two other people know it and that's my parents because they live with me of course so they see everything but when it comes to my ice cream i try to use fresh ingredients local ingredients that's why i make flavors based on the season our most popular flavor i would say was native mango which we don't have right now because mango season is over um guava local coconut and we just started a pumpkin spice ice cream for the upcoming holidays where we use local pumpkins and we boil them and parade them to make the ice cream. For ice cream lovers, they come in different sizes. Now we have three different sizes. We have pint sizes, 12 ounces, and we also have the eight ounce cups. We also do personal sizes. I mean, if you have a container that you want to be filled or a specific size we can do that we also do custom flavors whatever flavor you would like the 12th great advice for young persons wanting to start their own business any young person starting a business shouldn't feel discouraged i don't know i feel like they should just go for it once you have an idea and you have a passion for it you shouldn't let anything stop you if you feel like support is an issue I feel like you should work with what you have and the support will come as you go. And then as you do it, you'll realize that you're actually good at it. I feel like everyone gets better at something that they actually want to do. Keep up the sweet taste and folks, get your Raven's Crave on. For the Morning Edition, I'm Charles Fisher. All great stuff there. Challenges facing the disabled in our society live when the Morning Edition returns.
Jasper, what's taking you so long in there? Just a moment, ma'am. Just saying goodbye to some of our uninvited pests. <laughs> we don't have uninvited pets. Oh, yes, they are, ma'am. Down in the basement, where I sleep. Friends, family and pasta goompa. Pasta friends, family and pasta goompa. Pasta friends, family and pasta goompa. Your favorite TV show. Persons with disabilities still seeking some attention as they prepare for their awareness week. Our Lloyd Allen is live with the group. Lloyd, good morning. Yes, good morning again, Desmond. Good morning, Bahamas. This morning we're here at the Department of Social Services Disability Affairs Division on 8 Terrace, Centerville. And I'm speaking this morning with Mr. Kendrick Roll. He's the president of the Bahamas Alliance for the Blind and Visually Impaired. And he's uh, giving us an update on the Disability Awareness Week, which starts next week. Mr. Roll, welcome to the morning edition. And talk to us about uh, some of those plans that you have. Good morning, sir. Uh, and I first want to recognize uh, Mrs. Wendy Clark, who is the Chief Welfare Officer here at Disability Affairs. And also joining us this morning is Ms. Desiree Clark, who is the Deputy Secretariat at the National Commission for Persons with Disabilities. Um, on Sunday, November the 9th, we're going to launch our annual Disability Awareness Week. Of course, we'll be joining the church service via Zoom. And then throughout the week, we're going to be just doing a lot of public awareness on disability and disability related matters and on december the third is the international day of persons with disabilities um, which is celebrated in the united united nations from 1991 and this year's theme is building back better towards a disability inclusive accessible and sustainable post covid 19 world and we'll be celebrating that day with a virtual seminar on disability that of course would be spearheaded by the National Commission for Persons with Disability and then on Friday December the 4th we will do our celebration by having a national t-shirt day um, usually we have a celebration rally on December the 3rd each year but due to the matters of the day we are unable to host that event so we're just going to be doing our awareness and celebrating and observing with the t-shirt day and that will close out the week of activities. But um, yes, that's how we, um, despite the pandemic, we're still going to observe and celebrate our Disability Awareness Week once again this year. Now, Mr. Rule, of course, uh, you know, we're talking about disability awareness. Uh, and of course, our audience can see that you have your white in here with you today. I know that you've been working uh, really hard on trying to uh, raise funds across the board to assist others in the community who are also in need of this white cane. Yes, um, we had planned a promotion called White Cane Christmas. Um, I did that with a group. We have some other persons with disabilities in the group. We come together and do fundraising initiatives to assist persons with disabilities, and we were aiming to do a White Cane Christmas um, because there are a number of persons right here in New Providence and on the family islands, in particular Eleuthera and Grand Bahama and Andres, who are not in possession of a white can, so we wanted to do a fundraiser initiative to assist them with uh, getting their white cans. Uh, another initiative we're doing is the T-shirt day, like I mentioned earlier, for Disability Awareness Day. Um, funds raised from that is going to assist some persons with disabilities who we have on a weekly plan, who receive care packages. We want to do something special for them for the holiday season. So um, if persons want to support any one of those initiatives, I would encourage them. They can contact me through the Disability Affairs Division. That's at 325-2252 or 325-2261. And they can contact me there, and I would advise them on how they would be able to support any one of those initiatives we just discussed. Now, my final question this morning. Um, a few months back, I interviewed a, a very intelligent young man, uh, LeBron James Minnis, uh, who is blind. He attends the Aaron uh, H. Gilmore School for the Blind. And, uh, uh, he, again, very confident, very aware of his surroundings. But uh, we're talking this morning again about these white canes. What advice can you offer to the public, uh, those who may be unfamiliar with the world of per many persons uh, who, uh, who deal with blindness? What can we do to help? Well, blindness is a traumatic experience. And if we speak about the white cane in particular, the white cane is a symbol 
that identifies a person who is blind. It's also a symbol of independence, and it allows blind persons to move um, independently uh, throughout their community. So we want persons to always respect the white cane and try and learn the different the different um, signs for persons using the white cane. Example, if you have if you're trying to cross the road or catch public transportation. Um, these things we can make available through the Disability Affairs and the Bahamas Alliance for the Blind. So I would encourage persons to get educated on the importance of the white cane, its uses, and also other tips on how um, to deal with persons who are blind or persons with disabilities in general. Um, we have etiquette tips and stuff like that that can help to educate and update the public. All right, so some great information. Of course, again, as Mr. Rose said, everything kicks off on the 29th. That's this coming uh, That's next week, next Sunday. week Sunday, Sunday, of course. Uh, and so uh, we definitely will be following you in that initiative. Reporting here from the uh, Ministry of Social Services Disabilities Affairs Unit for the morning edition, Lloyd Allen, ZNS Network News. Well, that's going to do it for Morning Edition for this Thursday morning. Thank you so much for joining us on behalf of the entire team. I'm Desmond Saunders. Enjoy your day. Everybody's out there on the dock They're doing what we call Bahama Rock Hey, 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 hey Oh, yeah Bahama Rock 